All right, we're going to get started. Uh, we'll begin with the prayer request list. Um, on the praise list, uh, Donald DeVille has had a couple of successful surgeries after his uh, accident, but we're going to keep him on the list, but we're grateful that he had those surgeries and they went well. Also, uh, Ty Kirtland, Alice Mays, and Reggie Yancey are all doing better. Uh, recent requests, we've got Bill Billings, uh, Hallie Melder. I think Hallie's better. She'd be bopped in here looking like she was fine. Them young ones bounce back quick, huh? <laughs> uh, Pam Cloud, Ashley Dalebridge, uh, already mentioned Donald, uh, Michelle Dozot, Patsy Jenkins, Dalton Cloud, uh, Addie Gorham, uh, George and Juanita Reeves, uh, also Colton Chandler. Is he still at LSU or wherever hospital he was in? Went home. Well, we need to leave him on the list for right now, right? Is he still, still need to leave him on the list, though? Still need to leave him on the list? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, he's home? Okay. Yeah, like six to eight weeks, you said, huh? Um, be remember those on the continuing request list. Uh, those deployed in the military. I've added a couple of young men. Uh, Jeffrey Ganson graduated last year. He's in Germany with the Army. I'm not sure where Caleb Swanson is. I know he's in the Marines, and I know he's not home. Uh, I know he's deployed. He came home before Christmas, but wasn't home at Christmas. So, um, but be praying for them. I know there's others that are getting ready to go in the military from the school. Uh, another guy from the track team has already been through basic or been through some type of training already. But he's going to Fort Leonard Wood at the end of the summer for his basic or further training before he begins his army career. So uh, got a lot of young men and some young women, too, that are going in the military from up there at the schools to be praying for them. Uh, be praying for those cancer patients, uh, those in the nursing homes. Uh, I'd mentioned Bill Romunyuk. Uh He's improved the home list. Uh, those traveling, Roger's leaving tomorrow. Is it tomorrow, Roger, you're leaving? Tomorrow. And uh, him and Liz will be on their way back Monday, you said? Monday. And Miss Dodd is back uh, from Florida, so we're grateful for that. Uh, also be remembering the families of uh, Brock Brasso, Estelle Poole, Troy Stanley, Maxine Robinson, Scott Hunt, Harry Prather, Cindy Babb, and AJ East. Any other updates we need to make? Okay. You got a couple that are getting tests run and stuff. Well, keep us updated as to what what they find. You said Dwayne. Wayne. 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 He's been on the list. That's right. I knew I remembered Quaid. Wayne Quaid. 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 Oh, Quaid. I don't know why I keep thinking Quaid. Yeah, and we've had Nana. I remember. Yeah. Mental. Mental fatigue. I don't know. Anyone else? Lizzie. Is that the girl in the. You said brothers? Yeah. Co brothers. Co brothers, okay. All right, Lizzie Carruthers. Anything else? All right, well, if you think of anything, uh, message me and I'll be happy to add it. Uh, grab a song book. We're going to turn to 67. 67. <clears throat> Come, thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing. Help 
help us to praise Father all glorious, for all victorious. Come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, gird on the mighty sword. Thy prayer attain, come and thy people bless, and give thy word success, spirit of holiness, on us descend. O Lord our God, to thee the highest praises be, and for thy sovereign majesty. May we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Uh, 502. Actually, uh, go ahead and mark 616. 616. And once you've marked that one, then turn back to 502. 502. All right, before we sing that one, I want to read to you from John's Gospel, uh, chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. Um, and we're going to talk in a little while about Paul and his sermon in Athens. Uh, definitely a place where you're, you're outside of Israel. Uh, different type of folks, uh, different type of thinking. And so, you know, for much of the beginning of his career, Paul is talking to Jewish people, or at least Jewish first. But here he seems to go to Athens and talk to almost a complete Gentile audience. Um, and he has to do something that I think we would be smart to do. And that's back up and assume no prior knowledge of the story of Israel or of the God of Israel. Uh, you'll see Paul starting from the beginning. But we're going to read from John 1, uh, verses 16 through 18. Uh, For of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. God, the only Son, who is in the arms of the Father, he has explained him. And Paul will talk a little bit about that uh, to the Athenians. He begins with the idea of a creator God and then moves by the end of his sermon. He's, he's explaining to them that Jesus is the re revelation of this God. And Jesus will be responsible for judging us and how we respond to that God and how we respond uh, to our consciousness, which our consciences tell us that there's a God. Uh, there's a reason why we do certain things and we feel bad because our conscience is telling us that's not who you're created to be. Um, and so we'll see that when Paul talks to him here in a little while. Uh, we're going to sing 502, tell it to Jesus alone before we go to God in prayer and then uh, read this passage from Acts 17. <clears throat> Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving? Overjoys departed. Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus, he is a friend that's well known. You have no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that to man's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You have no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious 
what will be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You have no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that we can indeed tell it to Jesus, that he serves as our mediator. Father, knowing that we are sinful, that we don't deserve to come into your presence, Father, we can approach your throne of grace with boldness, not because we deserve it or because of who we are, but because of what your son Jesus Christ has done for us. Father, through his death on the cross, he has redeemed us from our sins. He has sanctified us. Father, we approach your throne because we have Jesus' righteousness. And we are grateful that we can come before you because of him. We can come before you and praise you for all that you have done. Father, we have been immensely blessed. Father, we live in a society which likes to, to point out the few things we don't have. And it's easy for us to fall into the trap of, of forgetting about how much we truly have. Father, we've enjoyed a good meal this evening and, and we have food to eat. We have clothes to wear. We have this comfortable place in which we can come and, and study your word and lift up prayers to you and sing your praises. Father, we don't have to fear persecution because of our faith. Father, remind us of how truly blessed we are. Father, most of all, we're blessed because of your son, Jesus. Father, we lift up to you those in other parts of the world that live in poverty, especially compared to what we have. Father, that live in fear whether it be because they live in, in war-torn countries, whether it be because of persecution. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ to you and, and pray that you will strengthen their hearts and strengthen their faith. Father, we do pray that you will supply each and every one of their needs. Father, we're grateful for all the answered prayers, many who are doing better, who have been brought through surgery successfully, who have been brought back home to us. We lift up to you those on our list, many of whom are mentioned here this evening, uh, who are in need of healing. Father, who are going through so much, face traumatic events. Father, we do pray that you will bless each and every person on our list. Father, we're grateful that we can turn them over to your care, knowing that you know what they need. Father, their shepherd, you are their father, that you will see to their needs. And Father, we ask your blessings upon our nation, those who make decisions. Lord, we just pray that you'll continue to be with them, Father. Even if they don't turn to you, we pray that you'll be with them. Give them the wisdom that they need. Father, even if they don't ask for it, Father, we pray that you will give it to them. Lord, we pray for our public servants, those in our community who who serve us, Father, often putting themselves in harm's way, our law enforcement, our, our first responders. We pray for those in the military who serve and protect us, Lord, upon them, and that you'll watch over them, keep them safe, avoid far from home. Lord, we do pray for peace, that they may conflict and being put in harm's way. Father, we pray for all those in the nursing homes, especially those who are struggling. We pray for those who who minister to them. Father, we pray for the nurses and the aides, and, and not only in nursing homes, but in hospitals. And again, all those who minister to us and help us with our health. Father, we pray for our loved ones. We pray that as they mourn, they find solace in your son's victory over death. Father, we do pray for those who are traveling. Father, for Roger and Liz, pray that you'll back home safely to us and all the others that are that are coming and going. I'm grateful for, for Dot's safe return to us. Father, we ask that you will be with us as we enter into this time of of study, as we as we look at how your servant Paul broached the topic of the gospel and Jesus with people who are unfamiliar. Father, I pray that we can learn some things, that we can gain some insight into how we can Share the good news of Jesus Christ with those around us, Father. It's becoming increasingly common that people don't have 
a knowledge of the Bible of, of Jesus. So like Paul, we'll probably need to start at the beginning. And so I pray that we will gain spiritual wisdom this evening, studying Paul and his attempt to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to those people in Athens, Father. Give us a desire when we see people who are, are thirsting or hungering for something that brings life, Father. Give us a burning desire to share that life with them, to share Jesus with them. We ask all these things in his name. Amen. We're in Acts 17. Uh, uh, we're going to begin with verses 16 through 21. Now, Paul was waiting for them in Athens. His spirit was being provoked within him as he observed that the city was full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers as well were conversing with him. Some were saying, what could this scavenger of tidbits want to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. I want to start off by just pointing something out. It says Paul was provoked when he observed that the city was full of idols. Um, I think we've gotten to a point where it's easy for us to, rather than feeling pity or sympathy for people who are, are wasting their lives chasing various idols, we become angry. Um, and I think it's because of many of the culture wars and things like that. But but I find it interesting that Paul seems to be moved more with pity than anything else. Because he sees people who are worshiping gods that don't really exist. Uh, various types of idols. And he's provoked by that. I don't know if y'all have ever had this thought. But I've had it many a time. What if my mother and father weren't God-fearing people? What if they weren't Christian? What if they didn't have me at church every time the doors were open? Like, do I realize how lucky I am? Would I even be a Christian today if it weren't for my parents? And I, like, that scares me, the idea that I could have been born to another set of parents that wouldn't have brought me face to face with who Jesus was. And, and if that thought scares me, then I have to turn around and say, well, there's people out there that are in that very boat. And if, it, and, if I, and if I shudder to think what that must be like, well, then why don't I look at these people with some pity? And, and I don't mean like condescending pity. I mean placing yourself in someone else's shoes type of pity. That's what I mean. Because that old saying, there before the grace of God go I, like I was led to it very intentionally. Would I have gotten there if it weren't for that? And so I think I look at what Paul it says about Paul. His spirit was provoked. Um, y'all, there's so many people. Go ahead. That's what happened. Yeah. Well, and so if you think, okay, and, and I, don't, I don't disagree with that. I think the spirit does work in the person's heart to draw them. But, okay, let's think about it like this. Um, where might God want us to play the role of, say, an Ananias? Where, where Paul, Paul is met on the road to Damascus by Jesus, and he's literally knocked off his horse. And then God uses Ananias to finish the work that had begun in Paul's heart. And so there might be times where people are being drawn to God and instead of being obedient, even though it's scary, like Ananias. And 
maybe God uses someone else, but what a shame uh, it would be for us to get to heaven and realize that we missed some opportunities. Uh, I mean, when you get to heaven, if you realize that God used you to help make sure that person was there and that person was there, imagine the joy in that. Like, I mean, we get joy in things when you help somebody with something or uh, you see them make progress or you learn. Maybe you're teaching your kids when they're first getting older to learn and they, they start to identify the ABCs and you're like, oh, and you're so proud of them. And like the little things, uh, maybe you're a track coach and they run faster than they've ever run and you're like, oh, that's great. But that pales in comparison to actually seeing someone in heaven and realizing that you might have had a part to play in that. But that's not going to happen if we don't have that that pity uh, for people that we see. And here's the thing. We all know people that are wasting their life. Now, I'm not suggesting you go up to them and be like, hey, you're wasting your life. But there will be doors that are open. Because when people are chasing idols, you're going to see cracks where they start to express doubt. You know, I thought this would be better than it was, but it's really not. And that's that the door is open. You put your foot in there and say, well, why do you think that is? Maybe these things here on earth don't offer as much pleasure as they hold out. You know, it's always uh, the average. It, all, it looks, y'all, y'all know them hamburgers you see on, on TV? And like, I don't know how they do it, but the patty is slowly dropping and it looks like they just got off the grill. And then you get to the, the place and it's just like, that don't look like anything that was on TV. That's, that's kind of what the world does to you. Like you, you look and you got like one little tiny shriveled up piece of lettuce, but on the, on the commercial, it's like a big, a big, Half a head of lettuce falling and a freshly cut wet tomato falling. And I don't know why they always do this, but it always seems to be falling down one part on top of the other. And it just looks like you could pick up the burger like that. And then you get there and it's like that. And it's been wrapped up for six hours under a heat lamp. And you're like, well, that's not what was advertised. Like, And that's what happens with the world. The world's like doing this slow-mo advertisement of how great this is going to be. And then you're like, well, that's not nearly what I thought it was going to be. And when you see people that are having that realization, like, well, that's not what was advertised. That's the door that's open for us. We'll see in a minute. Paul sees an open door and he, he runs right through it. He's like, opportunity is knocking. Let me tell you about this unknown God. We'll get to that here in a minute. Um, the second question, I kind of already got to it. How often do we engage in conversations with others about God? Might those conversations themselves open the door to having a conversation with someone else? Notice that Paul, at first, it says he's talking to reasoning with the people in the synagogues, the people that know the story. And then apparently in the marketplace, some of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers might be walking by and they're hearing something like, hey, what, what are they talking about? That did not sound like anything I've heard before. And so the more we talk about God, the more doors are going to be open to talk more about God. It might be that the person you begin a conversation with doesn't accept what you're saying about Jesus, but it opens the door to another person who will. But I'll tell you one thing, people ain't going to hear about God, if you ain't ever talking about him, if you think it's a secret, I mean, there were mystery religions back then where you kind of had to be invited in and mystery cults and people didn't know what was going on. Christianity wasn't that. They were out in the marketplaces talking about it. I mean, Paul, Paul's going to the synagogue, he's going to the marketplace. They said, hey, come to the Areopagus. He's like, all right, I'll be there tomorrow. And, and he talks about it with them there too. And, and notice also how easy it is because it, it seems like it's just a conversation. Y'all, this, we make it out to be something really um, intimidating when it doesn't have to be. Like, I've, I've heard people say, oh, we teach this such and such step plan. And y'all, just talk to them about Jesus. Uh, let me ask you this. How many conversations do you go into with like a 12-step diagrammed out plan? And, and I know what it is, is we think, well, I'm talking about God, so I got to be really prepared. And, and then we make it nerve-wracking because we, we treat it so different than any other conversation. On one level, it's different. Don't get me wrong. But on another level, if people sense your anxiety and your like, nervousness, it's going to affect the conversation. I think Paul's just having conversations and letting it go where it goes and inviting people to ask questions and then saying, all right, well, let's talk about that. And now, here's the thing. That requires that you be a little familiar <laughs> with the story of God and, and who God is. But you don't have to have a theology degree or some type of school training. Or if you've read the Bible and you trust in Jesus, you can talk to people about who God is. And, 
That's a good point. You do have you have to know what you believe. Uh, yes, and I think that's the thing. It's She was wondering what she was going to do with her summer. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, and the thing is, when you let the person you're talking to guide the conversation, some of the things that you'll find is, I remember in my time as a youth intern being surprised at the depth of some of the conversations that were going on with teenagers. Y'all, teenagers can think deeply. Y'all can think deeply, can't you? You don't have to answer it. Yeah, Avery's like, yeah, we can. Um, no, th y'all, they're smart. And, and, and they have questions, and they think about it, And they're also living in a time where, you know, you like to have fun and stuff. But sometimes these kids would hit us with questions, or they'd make observations. And you're like, did that just come from a 15-year-old? Like, um, even little kids sometimes will catch you off guard with what they say. And so, like you said, you let them, and sometimes you'll talk to them and realize, okay, I need to back this down a little bit. Sometimes you'll say, well, okay, okay they took the conversation there, so we'll go there. And But Paul is just so – Paul knows what he's doing here. You can tell this ain't his first rodeo uh, and how he's addressing this. But, but the important thing is he is talking about God. And, and I don't get the sense that Paul was going out there and making it some awkward thing. In fact, okay, these conversations, it seems to be a deliberate conversation. I bet a lot of people were saved because they went to buy a tent. Y'all ever think about that? He's, he's, work, he's making tents and someone calls up and says, hey, I need this tent repaired. All right, what brings you? I haven't seen you here before. What brings you here? Oh, well, you know, I just came to, to work with this, uh, this religious group up there and gets to talking to them and just kind of the conversation organically grows. Um, Paul just kind of lets people come to him. They say, hey, we want to hear more about this. He says, all right. Um, which is the next part, verses 22 through. Uh, it says, so Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything that is in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his descendants. Therefore, since we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver formed by human skill and thought. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now proclaiming to mankind that all people everywhere are to repent because he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. Real quick, I want to pass out a few verses. Uh, Romans 1, 18 through 20. Mac, uh, John 1, 1 through 4. We turn it around. 
Okay. <laughs> that, you don't look up if you don't want to read with me. Uh, Colossians 1, 13 through 17. You got it? Ben's got it. All right. Uh, we'll get to those in a minute. Notice, going back to what Preston mentioned a little while ago, how does Paul approach the Athenians? Yeah. You stupid Athenians. You worshiping everything under the sun, and they're, you're worshiping rocks. How dumb is that? I mean, I guess I suppose you could have taken that, that approach, but like what Preston was saying, <laughs> Men of Athens, I see that you're very religious. I see you have an interest in, in religion, in, in faith. Um, and you know what? I was passing through and I was seeing examined what they worship. Uh, sometimes we make comments about what other people think or believe out of ignorance, which ain't going to win you any friends. Um, I don't suggest running down other people's way if they believe, but if you're going to do it, at least do it with accuracy. At least go make sure you know that they do, in fact, believe. He says, you know what? I went through and I looked and saw all these things, y'all. Your, your objects of worship. He said, you know what? I saw something. You've even got one set aside there to an unknown God. And that's the crack in the door for Paul because he sees, you know what? For some reason, y'all are thinking there might have been a God we missed. There might be a God that we don't know about. And so we better make it. Well, here you're right. <laughs> Let me tell you about him. He, he's seeing that. They're allowing for the, op the chance that they don't know everything about who God is. Now, if, you, if Paul took truth serum, he'd say they don't know much about who God is because God is not some bearded, swole dude with a lightning bolt, Zeus or uh, Neptune or all these other. He's, you know, he's in Athens, and the patron goddess of Athens was who? Athena. Uh, you know, he's had run-ins before. Remember in Ephesus? Uh, they were big on Artemis there, and he ran afoul of the silversmiths. Uh, he knows that they're, in a, in a way, they're way off. Um, they don't believe in one God. They believe in a bunch of gods, which is, I firmly believe that that doesn't make much sense. Like by definition, there can only be one. Because talking about God as being all-powerful and supreme, if there's more than one, then he's not all-powerful, because why is there another one? See what I'm saying? Like, uh, there. That, to me, that's not a god. That's a demigod or something. But anyway, he approaches it by saying, you know what? I see you're religious. And I see you're even open-minded to the idea that there might be a god that you don't know about. And so let me tell you about that god. Um, and so he begins by complimenting them, saying, you know what? I see that you're seekers, that you, you are genuinely interested in faith and religion. And I see that you're open to the idea that there might be things you don't know. And so let me, let me tell you about the god that, that you clearly have already made room for. You don't have his name there, but but there is a God that has been unknown to you, but he's not going to be anymore because I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, now, he begins, like, like Bo said, he begins where they are. Uh, there's a New Testament scholar that kind of increasingly makes the case that, you know, right now in the world, you can't start with the body. You have to start before the body. He's not saying don't use the Bible. What he's saying is 50, 60, 70 years ago, you could go to people and say, all right, open your Bible to this. And But nowadays, people are going to say, well, why should I believe what that says? You got to back up before this and get them to, to see that, that creation didn't just happen, that there is a creator God, and, and get them to, to start to see that, that maybe this is the story of that God who created the world. But you can't just assume people are going to believe it because it came out of the Bible, because that is increasingly not the case that a lot of people are. Well, so you got to back up before that. Notice Paul doesn't start with Scripture. He's just telling the story of creation. Is creation in Scripture? Yes, it is. But they wouldn't know that as Scripture. They would look around and say, OK, well, that makes sense. Um, Romans 1, 18 through 20. Is that you, Matt? Read that for me. so he's kind of starting at that same point that he starts with in Romans. 
where, listen, it's clear we're not here by accident. There are some people that would argue we're here by accident, but I still quibble with them because I say their system of thinking just still doesn't make sense. It doesn't allow for our origins. Like, if you want to believe a tiny particle of dust exploded, well, tell me where that particle came from. Like, it, the Greeks, a lot of their philosophy, they, they referred to God, even if they didn't have a name for him, as the first cause. Which, they didn't have a Genesis narrative, but a lot of the Greek philosophers, they, they saw God as the, the thing that was there at the very beginning that started all this going. And we're talking about people who didn't have access to the story of Genesis. They just believe that, okay, the only thing that makes sense is there is a God that's above all this. That, and so basically what Paul says in Romans, the Greeks demonstrate that you can get to a belief that there has to be something that made all this without Scripture. Now, once you get there, you realize that Scripture tells you the story of that God. But, but so you have to establish that there is a creator. And not just by looking at the stars and everything around you, but by realizing, hold on, why are humans different? We're clearly different than all the other. But why did why were we made different? Well, this tells you that. But once you acknowledge that there is a difference to us, that this couldn't have just happened by accident, then you start moving into the specific story as revealed in Scripture. And that's what Paul slowly begins to do. What do you think Paul means? He says, for in him live and move and exist. Who's got John 1, 1 through 4? Is that you, Whitney? All right, go ahead. Read it for me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the life. Jesus, before he was Jesus, before he had a birth certificate that said born in Bethlehem, on whatever date it was, to Joseph and Mary, he was the word. And it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, the word was with God. Nothing exists apart from the work of the word. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That's what Paul means. Now, if he had just quoted the gospel of John to him, that wouldn't have been head nor tails. But he's, he's saying, listen, y'all understand that there is a God, and we in him we live and move and exist. Our existence is, is due to him. Uh, Colossians 1, 13 through 17. You've got that, Ben? Yes. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. He has obeyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His blood. In whom we have redemption through His blood, given us the kingdom. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether the throne or the dominion. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. He created everything. And, and in him all things consist. Other versions say in him all things hold together. In him we live and move and have our being. That's what Paul's saying. Uh, I don't know if he had written Colossians or not at this point, but he would say basically the same thing to a different group of Greeks at Colossae. That this, in, this unknown God, he has made himself known through Jesus Christ. Uh, what, what did we read there in John 1 at the beginning? God, the only son who is in the arms of the father, he has explained. Him. The transcendent God came near to us in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul also quotes this Greek poet, uh, Eratus who lived mostly in the third century BC. So he'd been dead for a couple hundred years by the time Paul quotes him. But when it says, even your own poets say, for we also are his descendants. That's interesting. Paul, Paul's quoting a poet of theirs. What do y'all think about that? Does that sound an awful lot like we are made in his image? does to me we have to be careful about this okay and so i'm not i'm not suggesting just willy-nilly go pull stuff but sometimes you'll run across things that might not be christian in their origins but they line up with what the bible teaches us and if you can use that observation to get people closer to the biblical truth by all means <laughs> paul would never interpret the bible through eratus but if he can quote a line from eratus that they're familiar with that 
says the same thing the Bible says and help them make the connection away. Well, that's kind of the same thing that Eretus is saying, that he's going to do it. Um, you know, there are beautiful things that even if it's accidental or out there that aren't from the Bible, but that might express biblical truth. Uh, you know, I think that's one of the things Paul, when Paul says, set your mind on things above, whatever is beautiful, whatever is noble. Um, by whatever means, if you can find an example out there that speaks to the truth of who God is or how we're supposed to live, use it. If it helps people connect the dots, use it. That's exactly what Paul's doing here. And he's doing all this because we see that Paul says there's implications to all this. There's a creator God, and he's now revealed himself to all people through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. Because the God that so many people outside of Israel didn't know about, well, he's been made known to the whole world now through Jesus Christ. And there's going to be a time where we're going to be called to reckon with whether or not we accept the truth of who God is. And, and notice how Paul is trying to be as polite and delicate, but he's not shying away from the truth that there's a judgment. Um, I mean, this isn't Jonathan Edwards sinners in the hand of an angry God. But he still doesn't leave out the judgment part. He gets them there, but he does it in a very delicate, I think, sensitive way. And so there's a way that we can navigate conversations with people. And we don't have to compromise the truth. Uh, you know, Paul doesn't end it with some sugary, you know, nonsense. Oh, well, I'm going to be OK. It doesn't matter. Just do you do you. And I, No, <laughs> he says there, he's appointed a time when we're all going to be judged. And so it's best to take up this offer that I'm giving you of coming to know this unknown God and who he is and how he's revealed himself through Jesus Christ. Um, and if they. Here's the thing I think is really motivating him. If they come to know who this God is, then, then life is suddenly going to start making more sense than maybe it did. Before. This idea that many of them had before that there's all these different gods and, OK, this one's over this area and this one's over this area. I would imagine that there's a there's a reason that there's not many polytheists walking around anymore. It just doesn't hold water at the end of the day. And so Paul is saying, listen, I'm offering you a better way of understanding the world, a way that's going to help your life make more sense. Most importantly, a way that if you accept it and come to realize the truth of it is going to put you in good standing when that time that's been appointed comes. When through this man, we're going to be held to account. And so hopefully we've seen some things here about how we might be able to share the truth with other people. Like, do you notice, did he mention Jesus' name once? I don't think he did. But he's talking about Jesus through the whole thing, y'all. He's talking about Jesus through the whole thing. And so sometimes uh, it might not seem like we're talking about, it might seem like we're not on topic, but we might be, depending on who we're talking to. Yeah. <laughs> Weren't you rounding these people up a couple of years ago? Um, well, and, and you're, no one takes being spoken of, of. And here's the other thing. Jesus' most harshism in the Gospels is for who? Religious people. Religious people. It's not the, the errant sinner or the ignorant religious people who ought to know better, who ought to treat people better. That's who Jesus really gets mad with. And, and so, like you said, if we have the heart for these people that Christ does, I, I don't think we would come at them with an accusatory tone. I think we'd come at them with a loving tone. Because here's the goal. The goal is not to be able to walk around, well, I told them the truth and they didn't accept it. I told them they were a sinner for this, this, and this. And that. That's not the goal. The goal is to win people over. That's why you're talking about Paul's skill. Paul's, at the end of the day, Paul's like, listen, if I don't get them to believe it, I, maybe my conscience is a little assuaged, but my goal is to try to persuade these people of this. Yeah. And so... Yeah, because he's not coming at them aggressively. He's just willing to have conversations with them. 
And my guess is he's having conversations with him because they've gotten to know him a little bit through watching him converse with other people. We can't just expect these occasions to happen magically. Doors are opened when we spend time with people, when we have conversations. Sometimes you got to have the small chit chat, small talk conversations before you can get to the big conversations. If you're waiting for someone to walk up and say, tell me the truth about who God is. Y'all, I'm a preacher and that's yet to happen to me. Like they don't lead with that. They, they, they're gonna they're gonna have some smaller conversation with. They might trust you with something to see if you're someone that's willing to be trustworthy, trusted, and then it gets to to the level of what we're talking about here with Paul. <laughs> well, let's uh let's uh, open up our song books. We're gonna turn to six sixteen and uh, sing this song before we uh, go our separate ways. <clears throat> We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, thou Son of God. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, thou Son of God. We saw thee not when lifted high amid that wild and savage crew, nor heard we that imploring cry, forgive they know not what they do. But we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. But we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. We gaze not in the open tomb where once I may go body lay. Nor saw thee in that upper room, nor met thee on the open way. But we believe, Joseph, why seek the living with the dead? But we believe that angel said, why seek the living with the dead? We walk on with the chosen few who saw thee from the earth of sin, who raised to her their wandering view, then low to her all prostrate bed. But we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the skies, but we believe. That human eyes beheld that journey to the skies. All right, let's stand. Uh, don't forget, if you want to go, uh, work day at camp starts at 7 a.m., so uh, we're going to get started down there at 7. Uh, so if you can make it, uh, glad to have you down there. And uh, got a couple other things coming up. I don't think we got anything this Sunday, but senior celebrations coming up uh, May 22nd. Uh, so keep that in mind. Got four seniors we're going to celebrate. So uh, a, lot, a lot of stuff we got to look forward to in life of the church. Uh, let's bow and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together as we're dismissed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.